Hello, my name is Kurt Kutai. I'm, Hi, Kurt. Hi, I'm president of Wildland Ventures, and that's Anne Kutai. She's the vice president of the company, and we are here at the Savvy Traveler in Edmonds. And I'm saying that you all know, but we are actually um, live on Google Hangout, so there are other people um, who are able to uh, participate in the program today, and uh, it will be recorded online too. So. Uh, also, here we have Jonathan Burnham. He's our marketing director. And Tad Bradley in the back is was our marketing director before. And uh, I like I sort of liken it to sports. You know how you have um, the teams have their scouts out looking around. Well, Tad now has become the Wildland Adventure Scout. And uh, so he's out in the world, especially in Africa, uh, connecting with people that uh, guides and, and lodges that, that he knows would uh, be the right fit for, for the kinds of experiences that we look for. And Mark, or Tad introduced us to Mark from Zimbabwe. So, and it's always great when we can have a guide or, or an outfitter that we work with come here and visit and make these presentations. So we do have presentations here uh, throughout the uh, fall, winter, and spring. We have the next one coming up is on Patagonia with Kirsten. She's great. And uh, so that's the next week or two, actually. That's Sorry. February 8th, thank you. So uh, let's get started. Um, I just want to make a brief introduction, and, um, and then I'll uh, let Mark uh, run this program. And something that we always talk about in our office when people call and think about going to Africa is just to first to relate how big it is. Um, and uh, so if you look at it, I mean, the continent of Africa encompasses all the areas of the United States, of China, India, all of Europe pretty much in, in, the, in the continent. So when you think about going to Africa, um, plan your trip according to the amount of time you have. If you have three weeks, four weeks, you know, then it's possible to combine Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, Nairobi, Johannesburg, Cape Town, you know, in one trip. But really, most people um, on their first trip, or if they know they're going to take two trips, will concentrate perhaps on Southern Africa or East Africa and two different trips. And then just so if you look at just Southern Africa, today we're going to focus exclusively on Zimbabwe. But uh, understand, and you can, and you'll, you'll see that you can actually have a fabulous safari just staying in the country of Zimbabwe, which we're all very excited about that the safaris are coming back online. Also the fact that you know, Zimbabwe was really where safari tours and especially walking safaris started uh, so many years ago. And, uh, and a lot of the guides that we work with in East Africa as, and especially all over Southern Africa originated out of these incredible uh, guide training programs that started for, as hunters, you know, hunting safaris, but then uh, transformed into photo photographic and wildlife safaris. So, uh, but just to kind of give you an orientation, and I know Mark's going to briefly mention this, but you know, countries surrounding Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, uh, Mozambique, and South Africa, it's easy to combine um, trips into different countries. You know, Zimbabwe is kind of in the heart of uh, that region that we'll talk about today. So Mark. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kurt. Um, thanks very much, uh, and good morning to you. Thanks for taking the time to come in. Listen in to our talk. Um, of Safari Lodges, it's our, um, our brand, our lodge holding company that within, uh, in fact, I should back out of it. We'll use this very close. Borges Lodge up in Victoria Falls, the Mining Intensive Lodge in the southeast corner of Wanga National Park, and then Camelthorne Lodge, our newest lodge, also um, down on the southern side of Wanga Park. Um, so let's just give you a, a bit of an introduction then to. Uh, some Southern African geography, but as he correctly states, the most important thing about uh, where Zimbabwe is is that we're centrally located within Southern Africa. You can do a wonderful trip just within Zimbabwe on its own, or link it with Botswana, South Africa, or even Namibia and Mozambique. Um, and there's some wonderful trips, itineraries that uh, people such as Kurt are putting, putting together in Southern Africa. Um, just to zoom in a little bit on the Zimbabwe itself, uh, the interesting features of Zimbabwe. Harare, the capital city, um, all the way to the number two city. Up in the northwest is Victoria Falls, World Heritage Site, and uh, truly one of, the, one of the natural wonders of the world. The Zambezi River, which is one of Africa's great rivers, runs all the way down Lake Kariba, the number two Sedona National Park. 
Mark Queens National Park up at the far north, um, off to, on the eastern islands here in the, on the east along the Mozambique border, and then at the Godora Zor National Park, which is down the southeast corner. Uh, to give you an idea of perspective within South Africa's Kruger National Park, immediately adjacent to Godora Zor. The other uh, one, wonderful tourism area within uh, Zimbabwe is Matogo National Park, which is near Bulawayo, and the Great Zimbabwe. Uh, rooms near Masringa, which is really central. Um, our company and the talk I'm going to uh, run through today is going to focus on the Victoria Falls area and Mangi National Park. Excuse me, there you go. Okay, cool, sorry. Um, Zimbabwe is very, very easy to get to. What you'll find is trips into Zimbabwe these days hub through Johannesburg. There's a lot of flights either via Europe, direct from the USA to Johannesburg. Um, and then there's about three flights a day from Johannesburg to Victoria Falls. So it's relatively easy to get to, um, to get in and out. There's talk about, uh, and there's been a big expansion project at Victoria Falls Airport, take wide bodies jets, and there's a lot of excitement that uh, um, um, Emirate Air is going to be flying in wide body jets direct. So it's really starting to open up again. There's a little strong view of optimism in this and um, Victoria Falls Airport, straightforward, small airport. Good. Three or four international flights a day, very, very easy to get, to get in, in and out. Um, what's really exciting is, uh, is uh, Vic Victoria Falls. It truly is uh, a spectacle. Um, from the Zimbabwean bank, that's Zimbabwean side there, one mile wide, all the way to the Zambian bank here. Um, it's, it is the biggest curtain of falling water anywhere. Um, there are higher falls and there are wider falls, but this is the single biggest curtain of falling with water. It's a truly great spectacle. I'm a Zimbabwean, so I always tell you why it's better to view it from the Zimbabwe bank than the Zambian bank. But um, what you do find is this is a high water picture, and as the river recedes, it gets narrower and narrower from this side here. So it's always the best viewing is along that that shelf there, within the rainforest of the Victoria Falls on the Zimbabwean side. Um, the Victoria Falls rainforest, uh, it's, it's always just a, it's, it's it's always one of the highlights of a, a trip up and down part of part of the world. And of course, that's a photo everybody loves to have, you know, um, along that uh, along the falls. I showed you in that earlier picture uh, the rainforest that you that you walk through, and there's various places where you can stop and see it. Um, the Big Falls rainforest is really it's a, a very uh, busy tourism area, but it's being preserved in its most natural state. Uh, it, you really have a, a feeling there's no laser lights or electric lights or any kind of um, the signage is very minimal. There's uh, Stone, natural stone pathways and rainforest. It's full of monkeys and baboons, uh, bush bucketing. So it really, there's still a, a wonderful feel to it, even though it is a busy tourism area. Um, lots of activities around Victoria Falls. It's with, uh, people talk about it as being the adventure capital of Africa. There's whitewater rafting, there's canoeing on the Zambezi, there's kayaking, uh, bungee jumping, all, all kinds of neat activities. This is canoeing on the upper Zambezi and canoeing among crocodiles, I suppose you can imagine a lot of fun, you know, it's something really, really interesting and different. Um, uh, sundowner cruises uh, up on the upper Zambezi, another wonderful way to sp spend an evening to end the day off for a day on safari. But more adventurous, you've got bungee jumping. Uh, it's one of the one of uh, the great uh, bungee jumps amongst the bungee jumping community. You dive into the Victoria Falls Gorge. Have you that one? I have. I have. And it's and it's, and it's fun. It's it's uh, there's another activity they talk about doing, which is the high wire. It's kind of like this, I don't know what you call it. But it's, it's, that's actually a little more fun because you fly across the gorge uh, as opposed to dropping and then bouncing up and down. I personally prefer the high water. White water rafting, white water rafting um, along the Zambezi below Victoria Falls, I'm told is uh, one of the best white water rafts in white water rafting rides in the world because of the number of class four and class uh, category four, category five rapids that you can do in a one day trip. Um, other trips around the world are sort of the Great Rivers of Colorado and things like that, to do the same number of that category of rapids is a, a, a four-day or five-day trip. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's people from all over the world coming to do our bike for rafting. Not for the faint-hearted, because of the climb out. Uh, and there, that gives you an idea about the climb out. Our lodge near Victoria Falls, Gorgeous Lodge, which I'll show you around just now. This is a picture taken from our dining room. Down. You can see the white water, the white water rafting uh, guys coming in here with the safety kayak. Um, we, learned was, we learned a lot of our skills from uh, the North American rafters. Uh, about 20 years ago, the guys from Sobek and things that first came up and showed us how to do the white water raft. 
and we really take them to the level now where it's very, very safe. Uh, that's one of the take off points over there. Um, okay, Gorgeous Lodge. It's our, it's, a, it's our lodge in the Victoria Falls area. If you're looking for a, a quiet place near to the falls so you can enjoy the Victoria Falls experience, but um, be away from the hubbub of a tourist town, uh, Gorgeous is ideal for you. This photo here is taken from a helicopter uh, looking back up the Batoka Gorge. That's the, that's the Batoka Gorge up to the Victoria Falls. There it is there. Directly below us is our Lodge Gorges. And uh, we say that it's uh, living on the, on the edge and it truly is near to the Batoka Gorge. One of the things we're really proud about is uh, part of, our, of, of what we do is we try to take tourism into, into uh, common lands, into tribal areas. Instead of building inside parks and making a footprint inside the park, we set up our lodges in uh, common lands and tribal areas so that revenue and royalties from our lodges, instead of going to central government, goes to local uh, tribal councils. And in fact, it's very, very successful. Uh, when it was built, this was the biggest project of its kind on tribal land, on common land. You already said we're a little bit crazy, but 15, 20 years later, it's a great success story, a great model for community based tourism. Very proud of what we've done. That's uh, another photo. Uh, the gorgeous, the, the views into the gorges here truly are spectacular. Uh, I know you guys from North America are used to big mountains and big vistas, but for us uh, in Zimbabwe, this is a spectacular view. Nearly a thousand feet down to the bottom of the gorge, to the east and to the west, about two miles each way, and it's, it's just a great place to to have a, a cup of coffee in the morning or a glass of wine in the evenings. This is a picture of one of the rooms, uh, interior of the bedroom. Of course, the best part of it is that, is that front veranda there. Again, same, same thing. Lovely, lovely place to go and have a cup of coffee and start your day. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have wildlife at uh, Gorgeous Lodge, but there's fantastic birds of prey. Even for the non-bird watcher, uh, it's just awesome. This is a picture uh, that was taken by a guy sitting at, at our dining, at his dining room table. He was having breakfast, and somebody said, here come the eagles. He picked up his camera and snapped, and this is those eagles hunting along that gorge edge. Um, we have a garden around the lodge. Of course, all the squirrels and the hyraxes and everything come into the garden and the birds of prey just terrorize them all day long. <laughs> uh, but these black eagles are, are, are wonderful. Uh, all the buzzards, uh, the, the black eagles nest on the eastern edge of the lodge, uh, gorge as it were. All the buzzards nest on the opposite, op, right opposite us. Uh, and we've got a pair of peregrine falcons that nest underneath chalet number one. You can actually sit and have your coffee. You can see the birds coming in to feed the chicks directly, although you can't see the chicks unless you want to have but, but you can hear them. It's kind of, it's absolutely awesome. It's a pretty good and whistling by the hundred miles an hour, literally hundred miles an hour. Of course, there's lots of, lots of other birds in our garden. That's right. a helmet trike with weak-looking African birds. One of the programs that we do uh, um, recommend strongly is what we call a village visit and school tour. We started it years ago as well, just part of the idea bringing tourism into the communities and involving communities with tourism. We really didn't want our young Zimbabwe school kids to grow up thinking tourists were ET, you know? So they flew by in an aeroplane or drove past in buses. So we literally just take guests down to the, one of the local the villages, often stop by a, a family member from one of our staff members, and um, grandma will show you around her household, show you how she grinds a millet, makes some porridge, granddad will show you how he plows with the uh, oxen still, just some real life uh, a real, a real life um, insight into what happens in our, in our villages. Uh, it's not people with laser lights and wearing animal skins and things, but just kind of real life and to model. The big thing we love to do is to take, we, we very strong supporters of our schools, both through our revenue and through philanthropy dollars that come from our guests. And of course, the big thing there is uh, English is our national language. Of course, a lot of these kids and these rurals don't get an opportunity to practice English. So of course, the teachers love to rotate guests through classrooms and sit down. Kids love to sing a song, they sing like angels, and of course then sit down with the uh, guests from overseas, where are you from, what do you do, what do you want to be when you grow up, and the kids love it, and you can see these kids are just having a great time. And I guess it's a real, it's a real um, uh, fun activity for them. Um, the other fun activity that we have is our, our traditional dancing. Again, same thing, trying to do things differently. These young men actually come up from the, the village nearby, they actually walk up in the evenings, and they put on a show that's a real interactive, uh, real life show. Of course, our guests always get involved. Like the Spanish ladies have tried to teach them how to do the Macarena, you know, they all, uh, which they still do like, about two years later. They managed to teach them how to do it. <laughs> okay, 
Um, take you back to our map here. We're up at Victoria Falls up in the northwest there. Um, that red line is a tar road that runs to all the way. A uh, good tar road, you drive along at 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour. Relatively interesting country, um, hilly, baobab tree, local number of villages. And we do a road transfer down here, uh, down to Wangi National Park. Wangi National Park, 5,000 square miles. Still one of Africa's great parks, 40,000 elephants, 500 lions, uh, uh, all five of the uh, big five. And what's great about it is very, very few tourists um, as compared to some of the parks elsewhere in South Africa. Um, and how long is that? Um, the transfer here, and I'll show you, that's Victoria Falls down there, to our lodges at Bomani and at Camelthorn. We do a drop-off, a minibus drop-off is our, at, at Harper Hotel, that's about a two-hour drive along the tar. And then we send vehicles, these are our two lodges, Bomani and Camelthorn, we send vehicles from there up to Halfway Hotel uh, to pick up, that's about an hour and a half. So you've got about a three and a half drive, three and a half hour drive from Falls. It's, um, and it's not a bad drive at all. This second part is on a dirt road, it's through the Ingarmal Forest area. You see some wildlife, but it's it's a nice drive. Don't need don't need teak forest, it's just teak forest, and it's kind of an interesting uh, start off to the safari down in, in, in our end of Wayne. This picture here gives you a little bit of idea of what we're talking about. Um, that's the southern boundary of Wayne Park, that's the Botswana border. Um, Wayne Main Camp, for some of you may be familiar with, that's the headquarters of Wayne Park is up there. Uh, and there's a lot of tourism in that area. And down the southern end, yeah, very, very secluded, quiet. Uh, we do safaris into that part of the park and go for days without seeing another vehicle. Uh, that's part of the reason we've been down there. One of the other reasons I like to be on the southern end is Wang is well known as being a woodland bush park. Uh, down our end, we also have some plains, so it kind of gives a little bit of variety in terms of habitat. Um, it zooms in a little bit again, it takes you a little bit tighter. That's the halfway house hotel. It's just, a, it's just a, a place to stop and change vehicles and then use the bathroom. Uh, and then we change vehicles and you get the four wheel drive stuff like that. Um, some of the other features within Wangi is uh, the Hyde, which is a, um, one of the well established photographic lodges over here. Some of the over there, and Wilma Safaris have their lodges there. To give you an idea about the jungle. This portion of the park going west, you will take a line from there running west, which is completely um, unused, no tourists, nobody, very, very wild. The kind of place I was talking to Tad the other day that you might walk into and you. If you, if you go walk about there, you could get lost and die. It was really, really wild. Um, okay, Wangi National Park, I was saying earlier, that's one of the Ngarmal Plain, nice fat pregnant lioness, nice wet season picture there, probably about April, May. Um, and it truly is one of Africa's great, great parks. 40,000 elephants, 500 lions, uh, buffalo, sable. Uh, it's got the biggest variety of mammal species of any of our parks in Zimbabwe. Um, I went to Wangi Park in 1980 as a, a young ranger with the Department of National Parks and Wildlife. Um, and in the 1990s, left government service and started our, our company. That I've, I've been in Wangi now for uh, 30 plus years. Um, that picture there, I'll come to that theme later, is um, I'm going to go back to um, the old days. We used to have this hard boundary of our national park. People crossed into the park, they got arrested, thrown in jail. Uh, animals would come out and Elephants would raid in crops, and uh, lions would come out of the park and eat people's cattle. So there's this hard boundary thing. That's a recurring theme that comes back. What we try to do is soften that boundary, get people involved, get, get wildlife working with good people, people's benefits. And I'll, I'll follow that, that theme further with um, some of what our, our um, company has managed to accomplish. That's Bamani Tented Lodge. That's our main lodge, a uh, lounge dining room area. You can see one of the tents over there. Nice uh, late, wet season. I mean, Early dry season, late wet season picture. See lots of grass and nice and green and pretty. We I show you how we did the road transfer to our lodge earlier. We have an air transfer option. Um, some of those other uh, tourism areas I spoke about, Mont Pools, uh, Gotta Resort, uh, long driving distances. You're best linked by air. And we have an extra close to camp. Um, that's a Cessna caravan that is bringing people in from Gotta Resort. Is that otherwise would be a 12, 14 hour drive. Another way that we're linking up Wangi with Victoria Falls is our steam trains. The old um, Cape to Cairo railway line of the colonial era, era. Uh, the Big Falls Steam Train Company is, um, has uh, hired three steam trains and they're opening up a, uh, what they hope to have by the end of the year is a daily steam train service from Victoria Falls to Wangi. It'll be about a three or four hour run, just a fun way to, to uh, travel between the two. We're very excited about it.
Um, one of the things we're going to have is where the steam train will do the drop offs. We've got a couple of tram cars, and we'll pick up people and run them down to uh, Lodge Town, where we are by, by tram car. It'll be exciting. Are you going to make new track? Is that a track over there? The track's there. So, track's there. That's one of the exciting things about Simdown. You know, we, we're rebuilding a shattered tourism industry, but the infrastructure's still there. The roads are there, the railway line's still there, the people are still there. We've still got all of the, all of the, the people who, who know what to do. Um, we still got uh, guys who, who still drive those steam trains. It's just a question of finding those guys, getting in line again, and, and, and the guys who fixed it. Just getting all those guys together again into one place and say, come on guys, let's go. This is a nice picture of Bomani. Um, I showed you earlier the photo we had from the front showing the main lodge. Tents on the, on the side to the left of this photo here, overlooking the waterhole. The lake dry season picture. You see the first picture I showed you, lots of grass. Here the grass has been finished. Nice head of buffalo drinking in the evening. This picture was from... Uh, Late October this last year. This is one of our um, spurring tents. It's in the new tents we put in last year. Very, very proud of them. Nice big tent. This is the honeymoon suite. Um, this gives you an idea about the size of that tent. You can see up the top there, there's the overhead fan. Give you an idea about this. Those are twin double beds, nice big tent, tiled floor. Very, very comfortable. Very, very proud of these tents. How they've turned out. Um, behind me is the door into the bathroom. Um, and uh, we have a tiled bathroom there. Big boy Matlala is our camp manager at uh, Bamani. He loves to do outside dining. It's lots of fun in the, in the big world. Pick up tables and stuff and take it out to the middle of nowhere and surprise us as to where we're going to have dinner. You can see the hippo over in the, in the pan. It's just a lovely place to have dinner at night, just for something different. Um, the, our nearest lodge, Camel Thorn. Clearly, you can see we built it under a huge Camel Thorn tree. To give you an idea about that Camel Thorn tree, it's got about a 35 meter spread. It's about a 100 foot tree. Um, Camel Thorn Lodge, we wanted to build it a little bit differently uh, to offer guests another kind of experience. Um, favorite thing here is to actually eat underneath the Camel Thorn tree in the, in the evenings and at lunch times even. Um, the guest accommodation, they're completely different from the tents that we're looking at just now. We wanted to make a, uh, we all love tents, but they're actually very hot and very cold. So we said we want to make a, some accommodation here that could be both warm and cool. Obviously warm in the cold months and cool in the hot months. Um, we put a big high roof on it here, um, big slide so to, to keep it cool, stone walls to keep it warm, got a fireplace on the side over there to be warm enough in the cold winter, oh, cold winter nights. Zimbabwe it's, uh, it's cold when it's 40 degrees, you know, we, of course you guys are used to it, but we're different. The um, big glass sliding doors and also sliding gauze doors, so you can open the glass and close the gauze so you remain open. Our top here is a little mezzanine thing, a nice place to spend your lunch hour. Catching up on your um, uh, notes and logbooks and photos. Of it. Look inside the interior of the room. You've got this nice, big, comfortable room. Very, very uh, uh, um, warm with a fireplace over there in the cold months, but also cool during the hot months, September and October. Those are twin double beds as well to give you an idea of the size of them. Our game viewing vehicles, uh, Fangman all Land Rovers. Uh, we set them up with six seats. so. Everybody has a, a window seat, as, as it were, and that's kind of a typical, classic um, Wangi National Park game going scene. Lots of elephants down at the waterhole there. Uh, Wangi's very, very dry, late, late dry season wildlife congregates at those waterholes. It's just a, a great way to sit and enjoy the wildlife. Um, that's one of our young guys, Musa Nube, who's um, a product of our school's programs in our areas adjacent to us. He works, he comes from the village nearby. He's gone through the schools from the village nearby, and now he's a young guy with us. Very, very proud about the fact that we're incorporating these um, young guys. 15, 20 years ago, when I was a gang ranger, we would have been arresting him because he was carrying meat out of the park for his father or his, or his uncles. Right now, he's a young guy, uh, and he's learning his birds out of his bird book and worrying about his exams. Um, Zim, we're very, very uh, proud of the walking safaris we do. We've got a, very, very, a minimum of a five-year training program for our young guys. Uh, some of them are even six, six or seven years ago. Great fun to walk in these in these areas, uh, particularly that southern end of the park. Uh, relatively open, it's nice kind of walking country. The experience you can have watching elephants from a vehicle is wonderful, but when you're walking with them, it's, a, it's a, another experience we'll be allowed. Um, walking safaris around the Garble Plain. Uh, give you an idea about some of that savanna country. We don't have the savannas that East Africa has, you know, those rolling vistas where you can see for miles and miles. However, we do have these pockets of these grasslands um, within our woodland areas. Incidentally, 
Maybe obviously it's elephant country. You know, we're very, very proud of our elephants. We've got a, we, unlike a lot of parts of East Africa that have got, um, where they're very worried about the elephant populations collapsing, we've actually got too many elephants. We've protected them extraordinarily well, and we've got this this uh, elephant population that's been growing awfully steadily for about 50 or 60 years now. It's one of Wangi's elephant, well known, particularly amongst the, amongst the professional guys, as being well mannered, well ventured elephants. Very seldom that you um, that, that they that they're not aggressive or uh, mean, and, you know, mainly because they haven't harassed historically. Um, Wangi is very very interesting. First, we don't have any major rivers in Wangi. Uh, it's very different to any of the parks elsewhere in Zim or in East Africa that are traversed by these huge rivers. And Wangi was set up. Um, Ted Davis, the first warden in about 1924, was sent off a, a map in his hand that sketched out the boundaries of what Wangi Park was. When he arrived there, he, he found that during the rainy season, it was a paradise of wildlife, but in the dry season, uh, there was no water. So all the wildlife used to migrate to the north, um, towards the Zambezi River, the Wai and Shangoni Rivers. Uh, what happened is through the 1930s, as those areas started to get settled, is wildlife used to leave the park every year and get into conflict with people, and his elephants were getting shot, and his animals were getting shot, and they'd come back wounded at the next rainy season, um, uh, having been uh, uh, lost a lot of their family members. So Ted Davison, with the best intentions in the world, put windmills in. He started to run windmills so he could provide water for his beloved elephant, and so they wouldn't have to leave his protection within the park. It was hugely successful. Um, by the 1960s, we had so many elephants in Wangi Park that his windmills couldn't keep up. He started putting diesel engines in, and uh, we have what's called an artificial game water supply program that involves about 40 or 50 uh, diesel engines that pump water for the elephant and all the other animals in Wangi Park. The only other park with a similar program is Tosha in northern Namibia. Same thing, they're very, very dry country. So um, uh, game water supply is kind of a, and it's a bizarre thing. It's completely different. You, you, you don't see this anywhere else in East Africa, but, but we're very, very proud of how we've managed and looked after our wildlife. One of the fun things that I will do is if we do an all-day trip in, in, into the park, and I call it a pump run. And typically, we'll put a trailer behind our vehicle, fill it up with a couple of drums of diesel, rations and supplies for our pump attendants. We'll take picnic lunches for our guests. We'll just go down water hole, water hole, drop off diesel, look off the, the pump tents, and we'll have a nice uh, picnic lunch and then drive home. It's a real fun activity. Drive 40, 50 kilometers into the park. It's a real, real good insight to what Wangi's about. Um, there's another Wangi scene. This would be. Uh, not far from where we're having our picnic lunch, there's our pump attendants we've just given their rations and supplies to, so they're good to go for another couple of weeks of diesel and the elephants enjoying the water. Can I tell them about the, uh, the Aussie and, and the developers? This is a bit of yes. a pump run. I was um, one of the first pump runs I did with guests in the same vehicle. I had a couple of Australian farmers and a couple of ladies from New York. And they kind of said, okay, I'm going to go on this pump run. It really kind of looks a little bit. And, uh, Anyway, we stopped at the first engine, I serviced the engine and then paid uh, the pump returns, we moved to the next engine. Anyway, the Australian sheep farmers said to me, no, 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 you sit, we can do this better than you. And they jumped off, serviced the engine, and the two ladies from New York, they did the, the rations and pay for the, for the pump returns. I said, okay, this will work. <laughs> and everybody had a, so it's everybody gets involved at, at whatever level they, they choose to. Um, this is an idea about Wayne Lake Lake dry season, picture taken from the air. That's one of the old windmills that's actually been replaced by an engine. There's water coming out, there's the elephant just coming in to get the water. And it's all sustained by this um, water. That's a nice dry season picture right at the end of the dry season, just before the start of the rains. Um, Duncan Watson, one of our young guys, managed to, I don't know how he got that photo, but he's bringing uh, the first, first lightning starting at the end of our dry season, and the elephant's coming in the water there. So we saw those pictures earlier with all that grass and stuff. All that grass has been eaten by the wildlife now. Everybody's praying for rain. Rain comes in and we get grass and off we go there. A picture of uh, some of the guys on one of our pump runs, picnic lunch down by the water hole, and he's just sitting here, and the elephants are pouring past him. You can see he's actually looking at more behind me, taking pictures of more of them. It's, just, it's really a spectacle. Late dry season, I tell people that um, I take bets often, and I'll show you a thousand elephants a day, and I often win. You know, it's, it's a great spectacle of um, Pictures after I finished that drinking, you can see. Um, that young bull's come himself in mud, and now he comes back and gets his uh, baby powder. Just great photographic opportunities now. The trick here is lining up the sun with the dust. That's one of my favorites, too. Uh, we've got two iconic pictures from our part of the world. The picture is of uh, you next to the Victoria Falls, and the other picture is 
taking uh, sunset pictures in Waiting National Park, and of course she's going to get a beautiful picture there uh, with the light on the water, the elephant silhouette there, and those are the pictures that you can get. Um, real, real, just a beautiful, beautiful sun way to spend sunset. Lots of other wildlife too. Elephants are my favourite, so I can't harp on them a little bit, but um, lots of other wildlife. This is some, some big the buffalo bulls coming in. Again, late dry season, hang around the, the water holes and the wildlife come, comes to you. And these, you can see these boys are enjoying their, enjoying their moment. Um, lions, um, Wangi has uh, a lot of lions, and I can honestly say we've got more lions now than Wangi's ever had. And I know this from my 30 years ago. Um, unlike uh, places, parts of East Africa, or perhaps the Kruger, where you might see three prides a day. Uh, typically, we'll see we'll have lion sightings five, six times a week. So, you might not see them every day, but you will see them. When they Certainly, listen to them every night. Um, there's a, a wet season picture that, again. You can see that the grass is up. Typically, in our areas, the grass doesn't get more than about two or three feet tall, so it impedes the game being only marginal. One of our lionesses, she was very, very pregnant. She's had Four cups since then too. So, uh, one of our cheetahs, we, you know, most of the animal populations are fairly cyclic. We find they go through cycle where there's a lot of this, and then five years later there's fewer of them. Right now we're going through a great cycle with our cheetah. Uh, our cheetah we're seeing nearly, nearly daily. Um, uh, this cheetah here, this female, she had five. This, that picture was taken when she was pregnant. She's on the reed buck kill game. We'd see this was about April, March, April picture. She had five cubs and she's raised raised four of them. She's a real, real good mom. She's part of the reason our cheetah are doing so well in there. She just she just gets all her cubs through. Um, here's one of her husbands. There's a pair of them. Wild dogs. Um, we've got good wild dogs down in, in our part of the park. They're in this particular pack, they're in a bit of a low cycle right now. We don't see them much. Further down where we go on our pump runs, there's a big pack down there, about 18, 18 to 22. Whenever I see my count 18, a couple of guys have told me they think that was 22. So it's a super pack of wild dogs. Uh, that's down about 60 k's west of the camp. Sable is one of the antelope species that we have in Waigi that is also a little bit distinctive for us. A lot of parks elsewhere in East Africa and other parts of Southern Africa that don't have sable and they're glorious antelope. They really are wonderful. I like that picture too. That young hippo calf there was uh, born at uh, Bamani Pan in, in uh, March. I think it was March the 1st or 2nd. Uh, but this is then done at Major Pan near us, just enjoying the sunlight. A nice wavy picture of that hippo. Um, Zebra. Well, I like that picture too. It gives you an idea about the Ngamu Plain. They say it's kind of an, uh, not, not typical of Zimbabwe, but typical of this part of Zimbabwe. The Wilby Street. This is probably about a, you see the grass has been grazed on, but I'm going to get some May June picture. Lake dry season, you can see here, grass has been uh, uh, eaten off. A couple of giraffes, you see these elephants. This is probably a picture near a, a warhol. Elephants coming in to drink, and the giraffe coming in to drink as well. Nice photo of a nice bull giraffe there. That's a quarry bustard. To give you an idea, that's a bird that stands about five foot tall. That's a wonderful bird. He's out just, just getting ready for his um, coming to the breeding season. That's one of his displays. Um, Hippo, Egyptian geese. Around one of the water holes. Black ear eagle, one of our favorites. Um, uh, in wet season, some of our bird watches, we <coughs> usually do in, two, in, 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 three, in three days, we usually do 200 species of bird. And of course, the raptors are always some of the most interesting ones. We spoke about some of the raptors around gorges earlier, the black eagles. Down here, we get the black ear eagles and marsh eagles. Lilac crested rod is one of our favorites. Um, crown cranes, they nest around. Uh, our areas during the wet season, they'll be nesting now in the early season. There's a nice picture of a saddle bull. Saddle bull stalk and the little bull coming in. Small animals too. Uh, banded mongoose. That's a nice picture of wet season in Wangi. Um, some of those stark pictures that I showed you earlier with those elephants surrounded by uh, just sand, really. And here's what it looks like in the wet season. You see the water lilies and things in that pond there, nice grass, and there's a, a herd of giraffe cantering through that. Wet season scene. Um, so it's the, the water lilies, same water lilies that you see around the Colombo Delta. You know, it's just this bizarre contrast between dry and wet season. People ask me about which is the better, and it's, it's like which you prefer apples or oranges. You know, they're both nice, but they're just different. There's a wet season elephants in the wet season picture. 
You know, I spoke earlier about late dry season, you can see 500 to 1,000 elephants a day. Wet season, this time of year now, you might see 20 to 30 a day. This is a contrast. Most of our elephants move off to the west. There's all the large parts of the park that don't have artificial water that uh, have better feeding for them at this time of year. So as soon as the rains come, about 90% of our elephants march off to the west. But there's always um, a good number that's, that stay with them. This picture leads on to um, um, what we try to do. There's a, a, a water hole at Scoffy's Pan. We said we were looking for a um, photography experience that would be different. Previously, we've done underground blinds, photography blinds, but we said this one, we wanted to do something different here. We put the 20 foot, typically, an uh, underground blind, they're, they're fun, but they're a great place to catch snakes, scorpions, spiders, um, and they tend to cave in as well. So we said, all right, we try to do something different here. We took a 20 foot shipping container, reinforced with some channel lines, buried it in at foot level and toe level, um, got a nice stairway into it. We put a flush glue into it as well. That's another feature of underground lines. You don't have a loop, you can get a little bit anxious later on in the afternoon. Um, and we just have this wonderful uh, photography blind that I'm really, really proud of. It's really, uh, I don't know anything that's, uh, that's its equal. Um, I talk about toenail photography. These are the photos that we take. These elephants are on the right. Right there, you can see that lady there. She's got a, hasn't got a very expensive camera by any means, but she's taking pictures of that elephant's toe now. So that elephant is standing 10 feet away from her beauty. That's just an absolutely incredible elephant experience. Uh, you really, really, really get a, uh, you get splashed with water and you just get this feel. So it's fantastic. And the photographs as you look up like that, it really is just great, great photographic opportunities. Give you an idea, one of our guides, Petrus, he loves serving cheeseburgers at lunch there. He started it. Uh, and he goes out and gambling drives, comes back during lunch hour and makes cheeseburgers while people know. It's just a real, real fun thing, different as well. These are the kind of photos that you can get. Okay, this, um, I'm, just, I'm just going to take a few minutes. Are we okay with time? You guys are right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just go. The, um, I said right from the beginning, part of what our ethos is, very, very strongly uh, linked with local communities. I really feel that conservation benefits, it's uh, useless uh, transferring conservation benefits to wealthy shareholders in international countries. We have to get uh, benefits from tourism going to local communities. Um, and this can be both financially and through um, um, actual infrastructure. This is just a, a photo I took. Uh, Going on one of our village visits, I showed you some of the things we're doing up around Gorges. This we also did through our Mamani and uh, Camelford. A couple of ladies here have been invited in and they're helping grind some millet uh, to make some porridge for breakfast. You can see here they're actually not doing very well because they're spilling most of the millet. You can tell by the number of chickens around their feet there. The trick is to grind millet and not spill the millet, but anyway, it comes with experience. Um, and here they're making some millet porridge and some um, dried spinach for their. Uh, reddish to go with it, but just a real, real insight into it. Uh, you can imagine, too, this is an opportunity for these people in these communities to meet people for the season. This is just, I'm talking about this linkage. Um, what, what, what the important linkage here is that these communities understand that these people are coming to visit because they're coming to see the elephant, and now they suddenly hang on, they come while they're, while they're here, they come and visit us, and now and, and then we benefit, and I'll show you the kind of benefits that they, that they derive from it. Um, our school is very, very proud of our school system. Um, I've got some photos I'll show a little bit further on there about um, what the schools used to look at, look like. But here's a nice picture, a couple of um, visitors from overseas. I know we're actually from the UK, but she, she just showed them how they'd flown from the UK to Johannesburg and how they'd flown up to come and visit here. Of course, you can see those kids, I mean, they're just absolutely enraptured with uh, learning more about what, what goes on in this world. That's an empty head, headmaster, and even he's part of the program here. Um, this lady here is um, giving them some reading lessons again. You can see the attention of these of these kids. They're really, really enjoying it. There's my friend Fusa again. Um, he's a rock star to these kids. You know, they just he's a great role model to them. You know, they want to be Fusa when they, when they grow up instead of going off to the park and going coaching. This is um, one of my the four pictures. This is where we were in the early 2000s. This is a domestic water supply program. This that well is supposed to provide water for 80 families. You can imagine what it. Absolutely hopeless state of affairs. Uh, what we've come in, and this is with some philanthropy dollars from some of our, our guests, is we're drilling new new wells. Um, last year we put in 40 new wells 
which the communities around our lodges. And there's Big Boy, we saw him earlier, he was doing the outside dining. He's now got his new pump and he's showing the kids how to pump at a high school that we built the year before. Are you What you'll find is out, out, where outside of the park is that there's the elephants spend about 95% of the time inside the park. Typically, they only leave the park at night because there's quite a lot of activity with people and, and, and noise. And usually, they only leave the park at night for food, particularly during crop season. Um, so, actually, the bigger problem here is uh, livestock, domestic livestock. The villages that are coming. As soon as you start pumping water, all the cattle and goats and things come. So, most of the fences around there actually for the domestic livestock. Um, there's, there's, this, there's a strong idea of communities within the tribal land and the elephants within the park. Um, and, and, and typically, there's only crossover uh, either illegally by the people and also at night by the, the wildlife. But this is this is straight domestic water supply. We have the domestic water supply program for people and the game water supply uh, program for wildlife. And they run hand in hand, in fact, because the same tools we're using on one side of the fence are the same tools that help us on the other side of the fence. Um, there is again one of our pumps. You find a very, very strong correlation between clean water uh, and the health of a community. When communities are drinking water out of rivers and ponds and things, they get all kinds of diseases. But this clean uh, well water just it's, it's straight away there's a Huge upswing in, in the health of the community. This is one of the that's a teacher's accommodation at one of the schools. This is before we started in that uh, building, in that mess, and the seven teachers were trying to live once upon a time. Um, this is my next picture here. These are the new teachers' cottages that we erected. They've since torn this down, but I keep this picture because people forget about what it used to look like. This is a, a classroom interior of one of the old classrooms. You can see the kids are still keen. They, they're keen to come to school. Very, very high attendance rates. 95, 100% attendance. But in a classroom, there's no roof on this classroom. These kids are, are, are on a roofless classroom. Um, this lady here, here of the community, teaches in incredibly difficult conditions. You saw the houses that she used to live in, building new houses, but she's teaching a, a, a pile of kids in this tiny crowded classroom. There's a new classroom that we're building uh, that was at, at the beginning stages. Um, laying nice clean concrete floors so they're not scrapping around in the dirt. Um, and there's the completed classroom there next to the old one. Nice clean modern classroom that will be good for the next 40 50 years. There's getting painted and everybody's excited about moving into it. Now Makani is another one of our community programs started up here at the Gorgeous Lodge. The AIDS epidemic in Zimbabwe, particularly Vic Falls area, was, has been horrendous. Uh, families devastated by it. A lot of the young kids that were orphans without um, without any kind of assistance. Um, some of the ladies from our lodge, uh, Pepsi Chuma in particular is a, a hero and after work every day, she used to sit with some of these kids and teach them how to embroider and make stuff for her to sell in her store at her lodge. Um, and these are the little uh, napkins they made and they're a huge success now. And the Yamakani Club has 83 members. I know some of the uh, young teenage girls have joined it when they're 30 years old, 23, 24 years old, and they've looked after themselves and their siblings. Yamakani literally means get up, help yourself, stand up, help yourself. That's a wonderful, uh, sustainable self-help program. But wouldn't work without tourism. This is the, the critical element here. Uh, we need guests, we need tourism to come into our areas so we can get the dollars in that can sustain these kind of programs. One of my other favorite community programs, we've, we've looked at uh, education of kids, we've looked at um, uh, village health through water. Um, the other aspect of health is, uh, that we tackle is uh, dentistry. Suddenly realized in the, in the early days there that uh, these communities never see a dentist. Um, uh, three years ago, we had 13 Italian and Spanish dentists came on a, a volunteer a dentistry safari where we set up mobile dental clinics. And um, in that first year, they did uh, 1,173 patients. That first year, they said the only mouth that they looked into that had ever seen dental work before was mine. Um, so um, these people just they're just absolute rock stars. That lady over there is doing root canals. So this is in an area where there's never been any dental care of any kind. They're getting fillings here. These ladies are getting fillings. And uh, root canals, of course, extractions are, are a big issue with um, rotten molars. Um, but also these young kids now where they had um, uh, no dental care of any kind at all. They're getting care from these guys. It's reached the point now, just finished our third one. Uh, that was my scorecard from 2013. Those are the five clinics that we ran. This year we did 1,215 patients. 
Um, but now I was looking to try and get our three year total is 2011, 1173, 2012, 15, 16, 2013, 12, 15. And our total for the past three years is 3,904 patients. If you take into account, if we do about 3,5 procedures per patient, you know, we've done something, I don't know what that number is, but it's, it's over 10,000 free dental procedures and a huge arc around the boundary when you park all that to course. So it's a wonderful employment program. Very, very proud of what they've managed to do. And of course, um, Wangi National Park, it's all about uh, where the game range is at, all about uh, looking after our elephants. We've got a healthy in, um, elephant population that's increasing, mainly because we're starting to involve some of our communities with our tourism programs. Right. <coughs> Wildland Adventures, Kurt, this is you. Thank you so much, Mark. That was Thank wonderful. You. Yeah. And uh, we really do share that, that uh, value and philosophy of connecting nature and people. I was telling Mark earlier, I worked in the Costa Rica National Park Service, and the only issue I was involved in was integrating people into that national park. It was a marine park, and fishermen would get kicked out, and the park service came in. And ever since then, we've always been on the same mission doing that. So it's been in different places around the world. So thank you so much. And so there's a lot more information on our website about uh, Zimbabwe and other safaris and other trips around the world that we do. In fact, there's a, a little overlay of the different destinations that we do trips in. Uh, we actually, uh, although it looks like and we do cover a fair amount of territory on the planet, uh, we've always just focused on places where we develop really close working relationships you know, with individuals, with people like Mark. Who then have the connections with their local communities and really facilitate a you know authentic and meaningful experience. So, and then uh, a little more details on different trips around the world. Um, actually, Jeff Stivers is our Africa program director. He's going to be here today, so he's the person that uh, could talk to you about uh, Africa. But wherever you go, it all starts with hello, doesn't it? So, um, thank you so much, and uh, Mark, let's. I'm going to back up and see if anybody has any questions about that. First of all, is anybody planning to travel to Africa the next year? Yeah, good. So, uh, where, are you going, where are you planning to go? Um, I'm going to the Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Botswana. Fantastic. How about you? Uh -huh. Any questions from the program? Yeah. Talk about Zimbabwe in terms of the wind, the wet season, the dry season. Yeah, the, um, uh, unlike you guys here, where you've got these winter, uh, summer seasons. And typically, uh, Zimbabwean seasons are more a wet season and a dry season. Our wet season, our rains usually start early December, and then we'll run through just kind of the end of March, early, early April. Um, then our dry season starts sort of beginning of May and runs through to October, November. The early part of our dry season, it's still relatively green, but it's starting to kind of dry up. Um, and then by the end of the dry season, it starts to get warm or hot, but it's very dry. Does that help? What time of year are you traveling? Uh, I'm really going to work. Okay, yeah. Good. Yeah, you'll, you'll, be, uh, um, you'll be traveling in the last two weeks of Feb. Uh, the, the, the height of our wet season will probably be January. But if you bear in mind, our rainfall tends to fall in thunderstorms. Uh, so we might have a, a good year in most parts of Zimbabwe would be between each of the rainfall, but that falls, falls over a six-month, five-month period. So typically you don't get the extended wet periods where you, you might have seen, but you might get rain on the other end. I love wet season. Uh, it's much, much prettier and green. There's less of the drama and, and, and uh, this fighting for survival thing that you see at the end of the dry season. So do it triple. Where are you going? Um, I don't know about wine. Enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it. Yeah. Anything else in the field? Let's go ahead. Um, the, the program that I typically do is up in Zambezi National Park and Victoria Falls National Park around the falls and Wangi. Uh, if you were to come for the for longer other parks that I recommend would be in Matusadana on Lake Kariba, uh, Mana Falls National Park, which is uh, it's also a World Heritage Site, uh, and then perhaps Ghana Resort down in the southeast. So it would just be a question of sitting down with somebody with some experience and uh, map out what you can do. Uh, the other thing is, is, is remember, don't try and do too much too in too short a time. I would strongly recommend, again, a lot of people who come through our lodges and they've been to nine different places, one night, two nights at each, and they're just having this, and they don't really get a chance to, uh, to enjoy our food. 
Yeah, I think usually three nights at a minimum is, is good. And then uh, we were just talking the other day too how because we're planning a trip um, in 2015 with the Aristas at the Wine Cellar. We're going to be doing a wine and wildlife safari. And you know, we're talking. We always discuss this question. We always do with the like the travelers is, you know, how much time do these flights and, and and we were saying, well, you know, I think we're going to probably stay four nights in Kruger. And we were thinking, well, we could stay five and we could split that up in two different camps in Kruger. But there's just something to be said about, you know, not having to keep packing your bag all the time. But when you're in a park like that in, in a lodge in a beautiful setting, it is so nice to be able to um, just have relaxed downtime. So you say, you know, you don't feel pressure. Like, I'm not going to go on safari today. I'm going to take notes. I'm just going to look at the water because it's a waterfall today. So you know, that's part of balancing it out. But in two weeks, you know, I think you could probably go to four different parks or lodges, for example, and it would be a comfortable pace. Because then we you know, have travel days in between. That would be a point I would also make. With the international travel, you know, you're losing a day and gaining a day. So you've always got two or three days of international travel. Before. So that, that always has to, has to factor in. The differences with modern tools, because I've heard a lot of people talk a lot about that. Yes, um, modern pools, like I say, it's also a world heritage site. I mean, it's 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 beautiful. The Zambezi River, you saw it around Victoria Falls, where it's this fast raging torrent. By the time it gets out to Mon, it's a big, slow, lazy river, <coughs> uh, meandering across the floodplain. Uh, beautiful scenery, uh, uh, backdrop of mountains. Uh, Monaco is particularly famous for the, for the three, four-day canoeing trips they used to do there. Uh, and you have this, this, this kind of very, very different experience. Also walking, canoeing. Um, it is a little bit harder to get to. The old Zimbabwe tourism product of the 1990s, there used to be an Air Zimbabwe milk run flight that used to visit all these different portions of the country. Very, very easy to move between Mon and Kariba and, and Victoria Falls. Air Zimbabwe's, that old Zimbabwe, Air Zimbabwe milk run has, isn't there anymore. So a little bit harder to get to. And when you start to speak to people to put together a trip for you, um, you'll start to see the, the cost starts to climb because you've either got a long drive, you know, sort of a, a whole day's driving to get there, or you've got expensive air charter. But having said that, Mon is fantastic. It's it's a world heritage site. There's only a handful of African parks that have been made a world heritage site. And then there's the parks in the lower Zambia and the Zambia side. And so it's we always sort of talk about how long you have and where you're going in and out of, so from Victoria Falls, you can get into Zambia easily on, the, on that side of the river. So, and so, yeah, in terms of budget and which countries you want to go to, there are different alternatives. And I think part of the point of Mount Pools is it's a it's a water, you know, it's a longer river. So it's nice to balance out interior parks with, uh, you know, wetland areas, you know, including, for example, Okavango and, and it's long too. So different, you know, different habitat types. I would strongly recommend trying to have a different different wildlife experiences by different ways. You know, the, the standard, when I say standard, the traditional Land Rover board trips, the walking trips, the canoeing trips, the boating trips, uh, and even if you can, is mix in a mix in an air flight somewhere. Some of these air charters we do from Victoria Falls to uh, our camps might fly over with Brandy Park. It gives you a wonderful perspective on uh, on, on things when you see when you see it from the air. So and that's what I would be. In, Find you, but don't try and do too much, otherwise you, you, you just run yourself crazy. Yeah. Okay, we have a question on Hangouts too. You mentioned hiring guides from local schools. Can you talk more about that program? Um, in our lodge company, I have guides who are specialists in different fields. Typically, the guides that I use for the community visits are um, young uh, guides from the local communities. They are based suited and best informed to be able to walk you through their community. Uh, some of my other guys might be better suited for taking you walking with a, danger, a dangerous game. So it would be a question of the activity that you do at our lodge. We would decide which guide is the best guide to take you on that particular activity. Does that help? Yeah. Can, Mark, can you talk a little bit about what makes the Zimbabwean Pro Guides special and, and how um, intense the training program is? Zimbabwe, and, and what differentiates them from guides or parts of that? Yeah, part of um, uh, to get a professional guys license in Zimbabwe, you that gives you the license to be able to walk guests with dangerous animals. Uh, to get that license is typically a minimum of a five-year program. So a 
a young guy, a guy like Muslim Tobi will join us from school. He has to first write a set of written exams. He has to do first aid courses. He has to do a series of courses. There. So he has to do shooting courses. He has to learn how to use a rifle. Then he becomes a learner guide. And through the next four years of his life, he'll work for, he'll be licensed under at least one professional guide now. We'll try and take him through his, through his, uh, try and get him to where we want him to be. Typically, before I sign off on a young guide, before I send him for his final exams, the one um, uh, line in the sand that I draw is would I be happy for this young man to walk with my family up to lions or elephants and then walk out again? And once, once I'm happy with whether he learns his birds and all the other things, but it's really important that these guys are, can, can take people into dangerous situations and be safe. And that applies with canoeing on the Zambezi when you're canoeing up to crocodiles and hippos, and it applies with all the other dangerous things that we do. And then also it's very important that they understand how to use their firearms, how to uh, administer good first aid um, on a significant level. And then they need to know at least 200 species of, of bird without even referring to a bird book. Uh, when we take them on their practical exams, we look at all the trees we see, and they need to know the names of that tree, both in Latin, English, and in uh, Shana or in Dibeli. Um, so we try to, and it, and it literally, most of the time, uh, the guys will fail the exams at the end of their five years, often go to six or seven years, because we, tr we, we try to keep it straight. We're very, very proud of our guide training program. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Uh, I just wanted to mention we have a couple things here. Some uh, souvenirs from Zimbabwe. What is this about? This is like a yeah. We um, the guys were um, at one of our, our local printing shops. I was looking for something nice to kind of hand out. We'd, some of those pictures we're taking from our underground live. We, we're getting toenail photography and uh, face yeah. photography, and uh, this was printed by one of one of the guys in the hallway for us for something to something to remember us by. The eye of the elephant. And uh, got some of the Zimbabwe currency there, and. Uh, also, this is a little summary of our trips uh, and, and our company. And there's a, a form here if you'd like to fill out. And as I say, we will let you know when we're doing the other programs. Sometimes we do have guides and outfitters from different parts of the world. And then otherwise, um, also our program specialists from our office come here, as Kirsten's going to be doing on February 8th. Right? So please feel free to you know, fill it out and leave it on the chair, and we'll let you know. So, thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.